Savage. Welcome back to Pathways to Progress. Happy to be here this evening with uh, Portland City Councilors Victoria Pelletier and Roberto Rodriguez. Thanks for being here again. Um, we get together to talk about issues uh, here in the city. And um, it, a lot's been going on lately. So, you know, let's check in for a minute before we plunge in, shall we? How, how are things going, Victoria? Oh, they're good. They're going good. <laughs> it's, been a, um, it's been a long month, couple months, couple of weeks, but things have been going well. Um, I just celebrated my six month six month anniversary as a counselor and that felt really exciting. Mm. Um, as so you made it to us, right. That's right. I mean <laughs> And it was it kind of felt like something like a milestone of and I'm just a big milestone person anyway. So I was like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this for six months and you know every day has been a new adventure really. So yeah, it's been good. Seems like a long six months. Really it? long six months. It might be sort of like teachers, though. <laughs> New teachers, the first year, they're like, I don't know. If, if they make it to Christmas, you always go, if you could make it to Christmas, yep. you can make it. So, <laughs> so I think I you've mean. got it now. I think so, yeah. yeah. It's great. It's been, I mean, we've been so busy since we, last our, since we last had our show, right? We've done a school budget. We've done a city budget. We've done all sorts of other work. There was a school election. Mm -hmm. There's been just so much activity in the city. Um, and yeah, it, it feels like it's just exhausting. Yeah. But onward. Yeah. Nonstop. Yeah. yeah. But you have uh, you now have a grasp of ranked choice voting because you've lived it and you've taught it, explained yes. it to people several times. So uh, ranked choice voting came into the school board election. Yeah. Didn't so it? we had I, yeah I've, I had a personal encounter with ranked choice voting and got to find out how the city decides ties. Um, but this week we had a, a school board election with two open seats, uh, two open at-large seat and one open uh, District 5 seat and a really contested race in terms of how many candidates there were. There were 12, 12 I total think, for, candidates. Yeah, that's for both. Yeah. yeah, so the ranked choice voting came into play. Sure. Um, and the, you know, the runoff tabulation came into play. There were no ties. No ties. It was a little bit cleaner. I think they got it figured out in like 15 minutes after they, they did the runoff. Um, yeah, I'll, Tori, do you, if you want to talk a little bit, I think maybe we have a lot more to, to say about what happened before the election. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing I will say for post-election is the most interesting part is that they will have to run again for the November seat. And I think that that's something that wasn't like widely known by individuals. So um, the two individuals that won will only have it until November and then they will have to run again. So they're essentially going to continue campaigning throughout the summer and throughout the fall. So even though they won the seat, it's not like they have it for that long. Mm. And so that part's really interesting because, you know, I think that they'll have to get papers again for the November election, probably by the end of this month. And so it's like, you're doing it over again <laughs> mm. and you're running again, running another campaign, doing the same thing. Um, so I think that will be interesting to see who comes out to run again um, for the November seat. And then that I think will be a full term. So, yeah. 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 That's a, those two seats are Anna Trevorrow's and my school board seats because we left with a year left on our three-year term right so that's why this is such a short and term both you and anna left to serve on the yes, city sorry, council yeah, yeah. so versus yeah. jeff irish he resigned from the board a mm -hmm. year into his term so the district five um uh member now or elect uh sarah brighton will be there for the next two years mm -hmm. and then she'll have to run if she decides to for a full term so did your candidates win am the i allowed to say that <laughs> I mean, i'm sure you had preferences when you ranked them you probably had yeah well them. i endorsed uh i endorsed two of the, the two at large candidates that won ben grant and uh, sarah lynn so i you know i knocked on doors for them i did lid drop for them mm -hmm. i canvassed mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. so i um, i'm excited i'm excited Static to see them there. Um, I think they're strong candidates, and you know they're who I want to represent our schools uh -huh. uh, at this time. Um, on the District Five seat, Sarah uh, Bryden is. I did not endorse her officially. Uh, I live in District Five, and that's who I was rooting for. Her and Liz Capone Enriquez were the two candidates that I was pulling for. Liz mm -hmm. came in third place, um, but I'm a, you know I'm personal friends with her. I'm a strong believer that her heart is in the right place, and she's just ridiculously smart. So I, I wanted her to get a chance. And uh, Sarah Brighton is going to represent the district well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were a couple other candidates in there that I know very well that were not uh, aligned, I would say, with, with the same values that I've seen voters ask for in our schools and some of the work that we've had to advance over the last several years. So by far, Sarah Brighton, you know, was, the, in my opinion, the best choice uh, and voters you know, picked her. So there were some pretty conservative candidates, I think, among those 12, right? Yep. People that are unhappy with the direction that Portland's moving or the Portland schools are moving of being more inclusive and more uh, equitable 
and having those values and, and those goals. Uh, do you want to talk about the, any any of the campaigning that went on or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, the first thing that that's just frightening, and you know, you have really what what you would only see at this time as national, you know, talking points and rhetorical talking points that are really incredibly conservative and far right uh, groups are are bringing out there. So they're talking about uh, critical race theory in our schools. They're talking about sex education, um, and they're complaining about all the equity work that the schools are doing, saying that that's not you know where our uh, attention should be and where investments should be focused on. Um, and then the language that they use to knock on all that is incredibly problematic because we know that all the equity work and all the investments that we've been pushing for in the schools is specifically to help the students that we've recognized through achievement data, through uh, enrollment in AP classes, and all the, all the markers that we know are conducive to success post-graduation. You know, post um, we know that these kids are not getting the same services. So when we invest in them, when we try to advance them, and you see this pushback, you know, it's incredibly pro pro problematic. Mm -hmm. of um, you know, how do we advance the needs of the most marginalized people in our community when some folks won't even you know, acknowledge that there's a problem. Right. Um, so yeah, it, I was um, worried for a moment there. Victoria, remind me uh, what the percentage of eligible voters the turnout was. It was pretty incredibly low, wasn't it? So it was 14% <laughs> wow. um, of Portland of registered voters that went to vote. And what's interesting is I put up this whole thing about it, um, and I still stand by that and, amount is low and embarrassing, but I got some um, data that said that that was like pretty like, standard for off election years mm -hmm. and for especially June elections. Mm -hmm. um, but it was still really low. And I think when we have 12 candidates, it was also interesting because I didn't see a ton of like press around these candidates. There were a couple of forums, but I just felt like, and maybe it's just because we just campaigned too. I felt like every other day we had something to do. We had a forum or we had an interview or in, yeah. just information was very accessible. But I got a lot of messages from people just saying like, I don't know how to find any information on the candidates. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I think that also led to such a low voter, voter turnout because people were just kind of like, I haven't seen anything. I heard from some people that said they didn't even know we were having an election. So. You know, I'm I'm more concerned, I think, with that because that can't happen again in November. And I mm -hmm. think we have some really important elections coming up. We have important local elections happening. We have important state elections happening. And I just really want to make sure that, you know, people are, are understanding that we need to get to the polls. We have a governor's race in November. Like, I, I just hope that, you know, Portland is really showing up and improving that we are a city that is really invested in what's happening locally. And I think we are. And so I would love to be able to say, like, Portland, like, we may not agree on everything, but we are a 60% voter city. Like, we, everybody mm. votes here. for the, We have a majority voting city. And that way, I think, when we do get these people in positions of power, we can say it's re really, truly reflective of the entirety of Portland, or at least the majority of Portland. So it makes it hard when we see such a low number. Sure. Um, and it's just concerning, I think, for future elections. I hope that doesn't happen again. Yeah. Well, you're a good leader for that. And I think the young people especially. I noticed that you invited the King Middle School students into the council chamber since I've seen you last. And <laughs> yeah. there were some really fun-looking uh, uh, photos on social media of the kids yeah. in the chamber. So how did that come about? Oh, my gosh. We had so much fun that day. So King Middle School had a climate awareness rally. So they marched from King Middle School all the way to City Hall, which was really exciting. They made signs. They were holding their own protests and they were raising this awareness and they had speakers. They had uh, performers that were singing. They were singing and, and dancing and playing instruments. And I was there um, supporting them along with two other counselors, Counselor Zaro and Counselor Fournier. And then we all were, just were kind of like, what if we just invited them inside and took them on a tour? It was very unplanned. Okay. Um, luckily, the city manager was there, and Councilor Zaro ran up and asked, and she said yes, and we were like, okay, we're going in. Yeah. So it was cool because we were like, okay, two lines, and then everyone's going to merge into one, and we're going to be really quiet. We're going to go up to council chambers, and that was also really great because, like, when you tell, you know, a bunch of 11 to 12-year-olds, we're going to be really quiet. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. <laughs> So it's just like hearing everybody come up the stairs, but I mean, it was great. They filled into council chambers. We, they got to ask questions. They came up to the microphone and they were practicing giving oh, public comment. That's so and great. I think they had a really great time. It was, it was more fun because it wasn't planned and it was yes. just something of, that we got to experience with them together. So that was really cool. But that's the kind of thing that creates future voters. Oh, absolutely. Right? Then they're excited yeah. to be old yeah. enough to cast their first Yeah, it was really, really fun. Good.
Yeah. Well, as long as we're on the subject of schools, uh, I also noticed this week that some data came out about middle schools, uh, about disciplinary data in the Portland School District yeah. that was concerning. <clears throat> it didn't surprise me as an, a longtime educator because the fact that uh, a student of color is more than twice as likely to be uh, experience out of school suspension or that kind of level of disciplinary action is a terrible thing yep. and it's <clears throat> chronic and it's been happening a long time. There were some odd things in the article like the Department of Education saying, oh, we don't uh, keep track of that data by race. And you know, you and I worked in schools so were like, well, yes, you do because you get federal money, so you have to. But do you want to comment, Roberto, on, on what the, the data said to you? Yeah, so I think let's start with why this data was presented to the school board in the first place. A couple of weeks ago, or like three weeks ago, uh, middle school students over at Lyman Moore and Lincoln uh, set up a protest um, so that they can share their experiences of having had both staff and um, students uh, harass them with either racist or racist um, statements, homophobic statements, um, and just like hurtful things. And when, when it involved the school um, culture, they felt like a protest was the way for them to express themselves. And literally, they, they organized themselves, they scheduled it. Even at Lyman Moore, I know that some staff helped the, the students um, sort of kind of organize and do science and whatnot. And then Lincoln had a, a, a process as well. So um, after the, the protest, there was a lot of pushback about how the students protested and whether or not they should have been allowed to do that and how the schools managed it. But a lot of the focus went away from what they were protesting about, right? Like, we know how that works, right? Mm -hmm. They never like how you protest, just, right. you know, ignoring don't what you're up, protesting about. Don't sit up, don't stand about. down, don't take a knee, don't, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so then the, the superintendent presents this data as a way to say that, listen, our data, objective data, shows that there is discrimination in our schools, and we're seeing it by way of increased suspensions and discipline uh, that has a disproportionate representation of our black students, of our ELL students, our special ed students. Um, and so, um, you know, that might not be like the strongest argument to show it, but there's a lot more themes about this, right? So we know that two, year, two or three years ago, we had a, a study done looking at the experiences of all staff who identify as uh, BIPOC staff members. Um, and this report, which was done by Bowdoin School with Doris Santoro, Julia Hayes, and Alberto Morales, um, literally summarized the experiences of BIPOC staff members and they came up with two themes. One is the impenetrable wall of whiteness and the other one is the suffocating smog of racism. So literally they're saying that their views and their realities are not being valued in our schools. And then you have- These little, are the adults. The adults, right? Like the staff are experiencing this in our schools. And then you have the children literally reiterate the same thing by way of their protest. So it's clear to me that that's what's happening inside of our buildings. We've heard it from everyone. Every time I went into a school, and, and I used to go to events all the time when I was on the board, these kids would be, they wanted to go out of their way to tell me that that's how they felt. Mm -hmm. I remember them waiting for me, and I can tell that you know, they, they're waiting to catch you and tell you something. They'd be like, oh man, these teachers don't care. And I'm not saying that, that that's, you know exactly how it is but when so many kids are telling you the same thing over and over you got to look a little bit deeper and so you know that's the reality of our schools that's that's not just Portland schools right that's public education these inequities exist schools. everywhere and it's not just public education right we sure. see it all throughout systems sure. so to to go out there and then deny that that's what our kids are experiencing to deny to have this Portland exceptionalism that this doesn't happen in Portland is ridiculous you know last year most like two years ago we had the principal at Lincoln famously wrote an email to the council where she literally said, these big national problems just don't exist in Portland. I remember that. And I brought that up, as it should have done in executive session, saying that I don't believe that a person that has these views, given the data that we have, should be in a leadership position in our schools. And then Jeff Irish, former school board member, famously resigned and threw that letter out into the open, exposing it and blaming me for the problems. Right? I the, had forgotten that that was executive yeah, session until yeah. he revealed the, because of course personnel yeah. matters are private yeah, and held exactly. not in front of the public. And so, you know, when you have leadership that's denying the reality of our students and our staff, mm. you know, how could people out here in the city sit and say that we don't have those problems in our schools? They're telling us over and over again. I've heard students at Lewiston High School say that there are those problems. I've seen students at Bangor High School say that there are those problems. And I taught in the Carabeck School District for many years and the Meselensky School District before that up in Central Maine. There were those problems. 
So, it, you know, saying that they don't exist is willfully being ignorant and not wanting to support. And it has such a, an impact on education. Like you were talking about, you were telling me that um, at Deering High School, I believe it is, every incoming freshman is automatically enrolled in an AP class. They don't necessarily have to take the AP exam or pay the fee to get the credits that you can get from taking an advanced placement course. But that access, that equity of access is huge Absolutely. because all those things are like gateways that some students don't get through after spending many years in a school district being told like, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you'll never have a job like that, you'll never be a professional or, mm. you know, in so many subtle ways. Yep. And wasn't there a huge pushback to uh, AP, for, AP for all or AP for everybody? It's yep. often called. So, you know, this all came about several years ago. We did a study where we looked at the graduating class of 2016 and we traced them all the way back to middle school and figure out what, what common themes can we find in these students that after they graduate high school are going to college, staying in college more than two years, and then eventually getting a degree. And we wanted to see what, what themes emerge. And two things came up. One of them was attendance. Right, so being in school. And the other one was access to rigorous material by way of AP and college credit classes in high school. So having a policy like Dr. Ahmed put in place over and during high school that every incoming freshman has an AP class in their schedule is key to breaking down those barriers, right? Those opportunity gaps. Sure. I remember when I heard that, that those were the key things to success for our students, I started to ask for data about discipline, right? Because how are we getting, how is it that the kids mm -hmm. are not in school? Because they're being suspended. And then I asked for AP enrollment data. And you can, I have it all saved, right? You can see for years, before Dr. Ahmed went into during high school, the, discre the discretion, I mean, the discrepancies were ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It was literally just white female students in AP classes. That was the vast majority of them. And then slowly, as we start to make it a policy that every student has access to it, we start to see more equitable outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, but it happens literally by force. It was Dr. Ahmed out there, say, I shouldn't mention his name, I feel bad. I, it, was, it was the leadership in the school saying that we believe in this, we're going to act in it. And even though there was a lot of pushback from people in the district, they stood their ground. And now the kids have opportunities that they didn't have several years ago. Well, being a leader isn't always fun. And sometimes it kind of paints a target on your back to be a leader and stand up for things that are right. I know that uh, tomorrow's the Pride Parade, right? Mm -hmm. It's Pride Month. And um, tomorrow's the Pride Parade in Portland. Um, and I think, Victoria, that you were telling me that there have been some disturbing um, reports of possible disruptions tomorrow and, and yeah. safety issues. Do, do you feel like talking about that? Yeah, and I think it's, and it just happened, so I feel like that's why I like brought it in here today, and it feels like it's just adding to me feeling a little bit frazzled, but there were messages that I was getting from individuals in Portland and photos that I was getting. Um, that there was concern that there was a proud boy presence. That Getting would be, how? Like how were you receiving? Oh, in, just on Instagram, okay. on in in my in my direct messages. Okay. So like people were sending me photos, or people were sending me like direct you know screenshots of other individuals saying, "Here's what I saw," um, and I just think that there is concern that there's an existing Proud Boy presence that's going to make themselves known tomorrow at the Pride Parade. And this has been in photos. There's a photo of an individual being handed a, a bulletproof vest that somebody had sent. There was um, a post about a potential like White Lives Matter a counter protest that would be happening tomorrow. Counter protest to pride. Counter protest to pride. White Lives which, Matter like, is a counter protest. Yeah, to white pride? It's, it's, it doesn't really mesh, but I think it's just basically there are groups here and there are individuals here that want to make their presence known um, in opposition to anything that is celebrating any marginalized identity. Whether it, when I said, I think I said this earlier, it could be pride, it could be a Black Lives Matter protest tomorrow, but any event that is in celebration of a group that has been historically underrepresented. We have individuals that don't think that that's good um, and wanna show up in counter protest to tomorrow's celebrations. So I had some conversations before I got here with um, the city manager and with other counselors and everyone is aware, um, they don't think that there is an issue. All of this has been monitored by city staff and by law enforcement for the past couple of weeks. They don't see anything that they said was out of the ordinary, but everyone essentially put out something that was just be, be aware of your surroundings, which you know should unfortunately be, unfortunately be commonplace regardless of what's happening tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard that we're having that conversation now, but 
We just had, you know, a horrific school shooting again. We had a horrific shooting in Buffalo. Um, and I just think that being out in, in existing and being a, different in any way puts a target on your back. Mm -hmm. And we have individuals now that are living in Portland um, that are really trying to show up and make themselves known in opposition to that. And it's really hard. I mean, the bulletproof vest clearly seems like an attempt at intimidation because even if you want to do a counter protest about the gay pride parade, where does the bulletproof vest come in? Yeah, and I, I don't know if it was like being given to this person and in, in like saying we are going to do a shooting tomorrow, but like you stay safe. Um, and I, you know, again, it could be nothing. It could just be a photo of nothing. But I just think especially now and just given the track record that we've had for the past like however many years we want to go back um these events are events where people who uh have a lot of hate and just want to show up and disrupt will have the opportunity to do that because everyone will be out in portland tomorrow and yeah. so you know I'm, I'm hoping that by exposing that the individuals will see it and say like, okay, well, everybody in Portland now knows that we're here. We were planning on a surprise something, but it's still, I mean, it's hard. And I think it's hard to be an elected official and to be a black woman that's an elected official to speak out against some of these groups, especially like the proud boy groups that we have here, because now like I'm the loudest voice in the room and I'm being looked at and, and can be targeted. So I don't know, it's tough. Yeah, um, this hasn't been in the media at all. I mean, I haven't seen it cover. I mean, the fact that proud boys are doing a counter demonstration. So we're kind of breaking that news here because we're live right now on, on cable TV. Um, but I mean, I sincerely hope, I've never, I haven't been to every pride parade in Portland, certainly, but I've never known of any disruptions or, or, or dangerous situations at pride parades here. I have been to some other uh, street events in Portland where there were some, uh, there was some you know, hostility between opposing groups and a little bit of trash talk. Yeah. And I've never, one time uh, there was a group that was uh, parading through the streets and they dropped their flag. And one of the counter protesters who didn't like the fact that these right wingers were parading through the streets ran out and picked up the flag and, and gave it to them. And, you know, I, you might see that as naive or you might see it as heartwarming. I, I, I keep feeling like, you know, our corporate overlords would like to see us have a civil war instead of the revolution that we need mm -hmm. to, to meet the people's needs and get government back to representing uh, the actual people. And I, I hate falling for that. On the other hand, I think we need to take really seriously threats and intimidation aimed at, uh, you know, someone who's tr serving as a city councilor. It's not like a highly paid job with a whole lot of perks. It's like a lot of work and <laughs> you got to do your regular today. job too. And Yeah, I was so thinking of that today where I was like, <laughs> we don't get paid. Um, and with that comes like the knowledge of just being like, okay, like I'm in a visible position and like, it's not just this, but it's like, I speak at protests. I was speaking at the pro-abortion protest, very visible. There was like a very mini, I don't even know that it like took off, but like there was talk about a counter protest at a pro-abortion rally. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's always going to happen, whether it's a very small thing or whether it's a huge thing. But I think it's it's great for people to just be aware that we are in a time where, of course, we're reading horrific news every single day. There are shootings every single day. Um, there's a lot of targeted hate out there. And I just think it's important for people to just know that. And I don't want to scare anybody. And I hope that it, tomorrow is fine. But I would have rather said something about what I was getting sent to me. I do feel like that is partially like my responsibility as a counselor too, with like a, a platform to raise that awareness. So I'm glad I did. And I hope that, you know, tomorrow is nothing but joy and love and happiness. So. Well, if you didn't say something and then something did happen, yeah. then you'd feel terrible yep. because you'd feel like, oh, yeah. people Definitely. did try to pass Definitely. the warning through. Yeah. I mean, is it a safety issue for you, uh, Roberto, standing yeah. up for what you believe in at times? Yeah, I mean, there's, so, right, like, we, when we talk about safety, safety manifests itself in so many different ways, right? There's your physical safety, right? Am I going to be physically harmed? Then, of course, there's, like, you know, your mental health. You, this is a small community. A lot of these people are throwing heat and hate at you. You know, we know them. They live close to us. Our kids growing up together, going to school together. I mentioned it before the taping. I coached a lot of the girls who were, whose parents are out there talking about us and throwing all this hate at us. Hmm. You know, I find it 
incredibly disturbing that in such a tight community, we throw rocks at each other so just freely. Mm. You know, and you don't know who you're hurting when it's so, we're so tight and you throw a rock, you don't know who you're going to hurt. You know, like I said, I have a kid. When people come at me, I worry about my family. You know, when, when I see, because Tori does, Tori does an amazing job in social media and being transparent and informative. And I see her and I, I know that she, I, I can imagine what her DMs look like. I can imagine the kind of hate she gets. And then when she shares it with me, I worry about like her health. Yeah. So that yeah. alone, I think, is important. And that's safety. Yeah. And when we talk about wanting to inspire people and wanting to get people involved, that's not the climate that I want young mm -hmm. people to get involved in. I want to step down from my council seat mm -hmm. and open the door, or, like pave the path for someone to be here and be effective without having to deal with like their safety being you know. Threatened. Don't you think that's a lot of the goal of this type of intimidation is making sure that the, the next Victoria mm -hmm. Pelletier, the next Roberto Rodriguez mm -hmm. goes, uh, I don't know. That kind of seems dangerous and risky, and I've you know got uh, yeah. people I love to, that I want her to be safe and yeah. And I think it's a it's a double edged sword when you, you when you are like paving a path that is that hasn't existed before as like a you know black counselor or counselors of color that like are have not existed historically the way that white counselors have. So I go back and forth between like, I have to take all of this so that the next generation doesn't have to. Like I will go forward and raise as much awareness as I can and be as great of a counselor as I can. So like whoever comes next, to the next Tory can just serve and do a great job and not have to deal with like all of this outside like racism and sexism. Um, but then on the other hand, I'm like, do I want to bring another person into this environment that I'm in that is harmful and can be really toxic and can really impact your mental health? Or do I just want, you know, all the black people to just like find joy, like don't come into the council, just find joy and be happy because this is not a safe space for us. So it feels like it goes back and forth, um, depending on the day, like Monday, last Monday, we had a really challenging council meeting for me personally. And I spoke up about how hard and frustrating it can be to exist in these spaces that are um, harmful and can be harmful to like black women, especially young black women when I'm trying to speak up and I'm getting shut down and I'm getting disrespected. So, you know, every day it, it changes, but yeah, I, I do think individuals want to make sure that we are silenced and want to make sure that we don't speak out anymore. And because of that, it's now I have to speak out. I have to continue to do it because if not, if I get silenced in any way, then they have all my power. So I, I need to make sure that I'm continuing to speak up and really thinking of the younger generation, especially like all the kids at King who I hope someday want to be involved. I have to be a role model for them and continue mm -hmm. moving forward in the face of all of this stuff that comes at you, especially I think when you're you know, a counselor with a platform and somebody that uses Instagram the way that I do and someone that uses social media the way that I do. So, you know, it's tough, but I think like we just, I focus on what am I doing this for and who, and it's always the people that are gonna come after me. And I hope that I can make it a little bit easier for them. Would you want